All right, welcome back to an episode of Plastic Weekly. Uh, I'm Tyler Norton, as always, and joining me today is uh, Io Sopaju out of Salt Lake City, uh, formerly of Toronto. That's how I know him. Uh, somebody I've actually spoken to before, before talking to him now, so maybe the chemistry will be better than the randoms I have to normally interview. How are you doing today, Io? Uh, not too bad. It's, uh, it's pretty nice here in Salt Lake. And, uh, yeah, I'm kind of excited about the topic, actually. Cool, yeah, so... Uh, now, I was first introduced to you uh, one-on-one when uh, I had climbed at Joe Rockhead's, the gym you were setting at in Toronto, in which I now work for. Um, and you were putting up these uh, circuits at Joe Rockhead's, competition circuit. Every week you would flip these problems. So they only lasted for seven days. And the quality of the problems was really impressive because they were specifically targeting somebody like you, who at the time was a World Cup competitor. Uh, and so the quality was high. The style was on point and it was really fun for me to bring my team kids uh to your gym to try them out and it also now like four or five years later working for that gym i get to work in this facility that was affected by some of the decisions you made and it's a place where um there are kind of three different time scales for the bouldering at joe rockheads at this point in in the middle is kind of like your typical bouldering rotation where you've got Boulder problems, they're up for like, let's say four to six weeks kind of thing. That's like pretty average for the industry, I would guess, something around there. But then on the two other ends, you've got, you know, your backfill, which lasts eight months, 12 months, something like that. Uh, So it's kind of these long-term problems that are up. And on the other end are these circuits that you started and that we still continue to this day being reset every seven days. And, you know, we... As, as root setters talk about, you know, what are the constraints we put on ourselves? And if you were to look at any bouldering wall in a gym, you might talk about like, what type of holds are they using? How do they communicate the difficulty on this wall? What is the intent in terms of the style? Uh, but an interesting constraint you put on yourself or an interesting factor is the lifespan of the boulders themselves. So uh, let me give you a chance first to talk about how the the circuits came up in your mind and why it was important to you to have something that was being reset every seven days. Um, well, I think I probably had a, a few objectives when the the circuit first kind of was formalized into uh, the weekly boulders. One was actually just to start to get people to move uh, and try boulders in circuits. Um, another for sure that I, I really enjoyed was that when they first uh, were used, we ran them with the climbing team directly as mock competitions. Um, and so the, the format that we used was to simulate uh, a competition. And that was the, you know, a, a center of the, 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 of the circuit. The practice basically um, I think those those two things probably were really nice there were a lot of uh, things that happened outside of that and as a result that made them pretty attractive uh, not only to, to the people who ended up you know trying the boulders after the team used them or even before on Friday night who came specifically to try these new boulders that were up um, but also that we discovered actually um, about introducing basically a new product into the gym that the roots were uh, a particular style and they had their own history and schedule in Rockheads. The, the boulders that were taped and in the rest of the backfill uh, were attractive to some people. And then this uh, circuit in its new iteration gave something that uh, we hadn't seen before, uh, and I think was really interesting for a lot of people as a as a product that uh, the gym could offer uh, its its membership. And actually, you, you know, wider than what it traditionally called its membership, people came from all over the place to uh, to try the circuit. Now, the people that were that were hyped on this, like people like me and and my team kids, like we weren't 
coming just because they were set every seven days, right? Like the the style of them, the, the intent was really important for us in that we were coming for the comp simulator. And hypothetically, you could have just set like seven or like a bunch of regular boulders, no particular thought given to what type of holds you're using or the movement and just like flip it every seven days and we wouldn't have been showing up for that product right like for so for this for this particular scenario a, a lot of the draw was the actual um climbing itself so given that you know the they were set first of all the the difficulty was marked in a very different way right like you you had a much broader range of what difficulty the problem might be when you got on it like it said it was pink tape and there was a circuit of pink tapes but some of them were way easier than others and some of them were like nails hard so aside from the difficulty the style what do you think the the time scale itself brought to the product what was it about the seven day lifespan that added something yeah uh i mean as a, as a constraint time is a really important part of uh of, of well of a lot of aspects of climbing in competition, it's quite obvious that you know that you actually have a timer, the five minutes or four minutes um, that are sort of your opportunity to climb at a type of pressure that's really interesting and uh, is a really nice test in a way. And I think that aspect, bringing that to people in the gym, uh, was really was new. Um, but also highlighted some of the skills that they would need in other contexts. You know, everyone in the gym is trying to do as much climbing as possible. And one of the ways you can do as much climbing, uh, you know, more climbing is to, to be effective, you know, is to send as quickly as possible. And I think that anywhere that we can add that kind of pressure uh, artificially in a training format, uh, or in a, in a competition context, the the focus that it asks of you translates really nicely into uh, how you engage with difficulty um, and problem solving anywhere. The typical clientele of rockheads at the time, like as an outsider who really didn't know what I was talking about, I probably would have like ascribed it as being a somewhat like place full of people that still had really deep roots to the outdoor scene where mm. the idea of time is is a lot more casual of a relationship um you can have your project for like four years and that's okay <laughs> and that can be four years of like trying it two times a week or getting out you know only when the weather's good like three times a season um were those same people those same kinds of people um, benefited by this kind of thing like it's was it a niche product or was it usable in that regard by pretty much everyone or was it kind of neglected by those people yeah I, I mean I think I think it took a minute for some people to to draw that analogy out um, I think it, immediately it was set up in a way that seemed very obvious uh, for people that were training for competitions or be trying to become familiar with a type of movement. But as time sort of passed and more people tried the circuit, I, I think that, and also that we, as we talked to more people, uh, the setting team, we just kind of convinced them that, you know, that this could help aspects of everyone's, um, aspects of everyone's climbing. You know, and so slowly, the, even the people, the holdouts, the people that waited as long as possible uh, before they would sort of sneak over and try one, uh, became a little more convinced that if it was possible to uh, to learn about different kinds of climbing and to apply the ideas that were sort of sharpened in the circuit um, to any part of their their climbing. Do you think there is a, a a weird reversal of values when you look at something like if you compare the circuit wall or like the circuits you set at the time to the backfill? Um, backfill isn't entirely mindless, but you are not setting problems as you put up a wall of backfill. You are trying to create a lot of different options, but you're setting it hold by hold. 
and you might spend you know a day or maybe two days putting up hundreds and hundreds of holds maybe maybe more than that uh so in in terms of how much effort you put in per per like per hold or per hour it's it's almost kind of lower than you're putting in for these circuits where you know circuits they're they're almost your like top quality product they're like extremely focused um like have a very pure intent forerunning takes a lot of effort out of it but you're setting them for only a couple problems and for a very short time span does it make sense to spend that much time on problems that last only a couple days compared to the backfill or the problems that last for four to six weeks like why is that reasonable right i mean i, I think uh you're you're right there there is there is like a it's, there's a seeming paradox there uh, that we shouldn't somehow spend time producing this thing that only exists for a very short amount uh of time or or presents itself to only like a very small audience but uh i think that 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 uh idea and and the idea of something that's special uh for me come to the the if if they were t- the same quality as the other boulders, I think that it would present still something uh, similar, but it just differentiated the product. You know that that uh, we were trying to do something that was about creating as high quality boulders as possible in a particular style, and produce them uh, in a context that really did juxtapose very powerfully with the backfill and with what people usually conceptualized as what was supposed to happen in a gym from week to week. You know, I think we used to talk about the idea that, you know, boulders outside are forever and we were creating something that in a really uh, powerful way uh, were closer to the spectrum of, of a competition or the final bowlers of a competition that you literally only had five minutes for. And I think that that, uh, that separation ideologically was, uh, was highlighted really nicely there. The ideas were different, and we uh, hopefully did them both uh, really nicely. You know, it was... Uh, as, in as, with as high quality uh, work as possible. So it's true in, in sort of like a, a traditional sense of how we might imagine the product of a gym and how we might minimize uh, the, the amount of time or money we spent with a product that could only be consumed in a very short time. Uh, I think we, we consciously wanted to uh, continue in I think an idea that basically was was Bob's uh, or was for me represented really well in, in how Bob um, treated competition and that was that we could use all the resources make as high quality as pro- a product as possible all the time regardless of what the um, what the cost in an old sense would be and, and then te- I think really it bared out uh, over time. It, the, the, the idea was strong enough that it was a bigger benefit uh, in, in, in a lot of ways than the cost was. Do you think you're, like this kind of idea contributes to the idea of indoor climbers that have really short attention spans? <laughs> That's a, that's a great question. It's probably not for me to answer uh, <laughs> directly, you know, in sort of the psychological. But uh, but yeah, that's that's a really that's an interesting one. Maybe there is something about uh, about consumability or, uh, or or attention span. Uh, but but not all bad, you know. Also, I think that a lot of those uh, like new school or. Oh, things are sort of looked down upon by a, a, like a conservative or traditionalist or, you know, some uh, viewpoint. But the, for me, experimenting was really nice. Uh, the pressure, working under that pressure to produce the highest quality with uh, 
the shortest amount of time possible. It was great practice for us as root setters to to get better at working under pressure and producing boulders, essentially where we would do the same thing for competition. Uh, and then to deal with some of the themes that uh, of movement that the the uh, the climbers and the root setters were ha- having to deal with, the, we because they turned so quickly would have a really good feedback loop of how do I create this style? We we would make the experiment, and then we would see immediately how uh, the membership or the team would do. And within a week, when we could remember exactly how it felt, we could tweak the ideas slightly so that we could uh, become better at how we produce the things that we were intending to, or uh, leaving the kinds of space and how we could leave the kinds of space that would create some surprises. Can you talk a bit more about the idea of leaving space? Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, at one point when uh, the three of us, when Sachi, CU, and myself started to set the circuits, um, because we only had a day to do it, we um, we we started to to run a whole bunch of setting games. Eventually, we would each have fifteen minutes to set a skeleton in separate areas, and then we would switch. We would switch and you would have only 15 minutes to, or actually sometimes less. I think the first round was 15 minute skeletons. We ran 10 minutes to refine the boulders. And that was um, to take whatever you found from the other person's skeleton and sharpen it. To tighten that and make it into a finished boulder so that we could run for running. And I think that uh, two, two aspects of that um, had to do with with you know what we call leave space for for a surprise is that we would come to this thing and it was sometimes very very loosely um, put together. It was you know one or two volumes or one or two or three holds, and to interpret that, you had to do you know, have a pretty open mind as to, A, what the the root setter sort of intend, but ultimately when we started to do this, it was not about what the root setter intended as much as it was about, okay, what can I do with this? Uh, And that, I think, that aspect of how to interpret what is is on the wall really did, um, really did leave a lot of opportunity for the second person to um, to engage with that idea, but also to take it in a new direction. And you know, ultimately, the the same process happens when the climber comes in front of the boulder. They can spend a whole bunch of time thinking about what was intended, uh, or they can take what's there and do whatever they can with it. And I think those themes really kind of popped and highlighted for us as we were uh, as we were doing that because a third thing that we did after we uh, made the boulders is we removed as much as possible that's a if you've worked with me you know that for sure um, I'm very much into uh, the idea that we can take as much from the physical boulder as possible to leave the climber to have to interpret more. There, there are, uh, I, in my brain, two kinds of, usually what root setters are referred to as complexity. And one is, I call scale. We add choice by putting more on. Um, but a second type of complexity that I really, really enjoy is um, achieved, I think, by removing as much as possible so that a similar type of option uh, or decision has to be made. And so we really did that quite a bit with the, uh, with the circuit. We would make these boulders, and you really only have time to put six or seven holds on. 
uh, holds their volumes. Then we forerun these things to find out how they can be climbed, you know, using um, either everything. It's very, very uh, often we removed as much as possible from them, and often, uh, but but not as often really, we would add things to them. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So let's keep on the on the subject of of how long these things stay up. So you're not <laughs> yeah. a competitor as much anymore. Uh, root setting is is the is the main thing for you. Um, and I guess in the last little bit, you've been doing a lot of commercial root setting and just kind of like day in, day out stuff. Um, does the idea of playing around with timescales intrigue you more from a competition perspective or from a commercial perspective? Uh, I mean, I think both are really important to me. Uh, I have for a long time thought that it was really nice to try to connect competitive climbing with uh, what we're usually calling sort of the commercial context it, as much as possible. The, the person who's climbing on the weekend uh, has a similar kind of pressure that, to the competitive climber and their training methods, especially when we move towards psychology uh, and the brain, are very similar. They have to do the same things, interpret uh, climbing react to climbing, improvise with climbing, and use training or whatever they have brought with them um, in a really personal uh, space. And I think that uh, it's, it's easy to do in the competition because, well, for two reasons. Competitors expect to be under pressure uh, they expect things to be very hard, and they don't expect to be comfortable. To uh, a lesser extent, in the commercial context, we uh, we give people an easier time. Uh, I mean, we, for one thing, we have to recognize that they do have a lot of different objectives. Some people are coming with, to the gym with their grandpa to hang out. Uh, and so we don't need to give them the kind of pressure experience. But uh, anywhere in the, the context of climbing, I think that we can uh, surprise someone. I think that we usually, uh, we usually give them the opportunity to improvise. And I think that's a, a very nice aspect of performance that we typically undersell to commercial climbers. So it's easier to do in the in the competition context, uh, but it has a lot of value, and I really do like to add those ideas into uh, the place that we didn't expect them into the commercial context uh, whenever we can. So, this is something. Last time I spoke to you, I guess was like December. I think I think you were in town briefly or something, mm -hmm. and uh, you you were just kind of musing a little bit about uh, some things you'd like to try in terms of how long you leave a boulder up. Can you talk about some of the the experiments that you've either had a chance to play around with or things you you think would be a worthwhile endeavor for for some uh, gyms or whatever? I mean, I think for sure uh, playing with playing with time and constraints is an activity that is becoming very popular in root setting. Uh, uh, the, the thinking of the product, uh, and I sort of am liking that idea less these days, that, that we're offering anyone that comes into our facilities uh, is, I think, a really nice idea. And to make a diverse offering is... Uh, uh, is the, my, one of my goals for sure. So I think it's a it's a great idea if you if you own a climbing gym or are you uh, work in that context in, in any context is to take a really good look at what you offer people and then play with it a little bit. Um, uh, the, to to sort of be specific and I I think that. Maybe I, I talked about that, I uh, even alluded to it earlier to, today, is that because the gym allows us um, the 
the the opportunity to change things at a at rates that are that represent an opposite to outside it's for me very cool to do that as much as possible to have boulders that are are literally only up for a day um, so that we can experience uh, how moving through those boulders are and, and I think that as a climber personally my experience in competitions you know where you fly to Munich you go out to the first round and you literally only have five minutes on five boulders you are forced in a really special way to try everything to throw everything that you have at this boulder in order to make it work on the front end and then once the five minutes is over you have basically the rest of your life if you want to to analyze what happened in those five minutes and I think that's a, a really interesting uh, place for people to develop that and it stands a little bit to the opposite of the idea that we uh, have a short attention span consume this thing very quickly and then throw it away in fact I think we uh, in the most powerful instances the most effective instances even the five minutes um, can have really lasting impact. It's more about concentration, I mean, a concentration of the effect, than it is about uh, a fleeting aspect. And I think playing with that spectrum um, and that idea is one of the things that I, I really like and, and has a lot to do with the experiments that I want to uh, sort of continue in a, in a few contexts. You know, it's it's not possible to do it on every boulder in every commercial setting, uh, and sometimes it is necessary to keep it for a competition, or it's very nice to keep it for a competition. But I think one of the things that uh, we talk about a lot in experience when we say climbing, it is about bringing more people uh, into a similar experience. Uh, and I think that's a, a fun place to do it. Kind of tying into the, the, um, I've lost the word, but the, uh, the idea of attention spans falling off mm -hmm. your, your relationship with a Munich boulder, you know, and Munich is once a year, right? And there are exactly, unless you make it to semifinals or something, there's, there's five of them. Right. Um, and it is, it is, you know, you get five a year and that's, and that's it. It's not, not quite the same thing, but at, at Joe's, you know, you have customers that they expect 12 new circuit problems every Friday night. And if that process is delayed by like one day, if they, if you know, if they're the people that come in Friday night, right after the set is done and then they come in the next week and those problems are still up, that's just too long for them. And, you know, then they have to kind of like sadly mosey on over to the other problems, which have been up for an eternal three weeks and try and somehow build a relationship with those, uh, with those climbs. I, doesn't the, doesn't the idea of like a, of a very short term, uh, boulder kind of lose the magic if it's something that becomes like a regular product that you just like, Oh, I get, I get this, you know, I go to my gym and every day there's a new boulder that only lasts for a day. And eventually those inevitably just start to meld into nothingness, right? Like you, you can't agonize over that boulder. Like you're talking about, I, I feel so bad for you if you're still thinking about a particular Munich boulder from, from however many years ago, but, but th doesn't that value change? once you've just had it like every session you go to the gym uh you're i, I think that there, there's something there for sure that uh uh you're, you're right it is it's possible to agonize i'll start there I'll, it's possible <laughs> to agonize from the to on the new munich boulder or the foot slip but it is possible to learn from it and i think that's uh usually where i like to on the boulders that i'm thinking about forever um but to the idea that we, we created a, a sort of a, a monster uh, by giving the expectation now of uh, Friday night at, let's say, 6 o'clock, mm -hmm. the, the boulder being released to the people. It's true that, yes, uh, in a way that, that that is the way that 
uh, you know, a lot of people reacted. We we flew quite loose with the boulders when we started, uh, and in a lot of climbing contexts or setting contexts that I've been in, uh, we give ourselves a, a set amount of time and must be finished before that, and that expectation is is nice if it's met um, for the people that you know traveled a long way, uh, etc. In order to climb, but I think that. Uh, another aspect of what we're kind of touching on in a lot of these themes is the idea that you have to take what you have and use it as best as you have, or as best as you can. So when I show up at the gym and the this particular boulder that I wanted to try doesn't exist, that I can go home or... I can find another way to use that attention. You know, uh, another thing, one of the things that we did with the circuits that was sort of mean, but also uh, I, I liked, was that we didn't create the same continuity that existed in the other boulders. We, when we first made the circuits, there were only there were two circuits. Uh, one was uh, one was purple and one was pink. And we didn't define those two things so well that you knew exactly what you were getting into when you tried them. And I think that's an aspect of uh, training, improvisation, and climbing that people really have a hard time digesting uh, and getting used to. But it is an aspect, is a quality of the best climbers that I meet uh, that they are very good at dealing with. And th that's the, the type of connection that I liked also in, uh, in you know, the, the circuit now has, instead of grades, it has three ranges. And the ranges relatively overlap. Um, but there are tiny gaps in the practice that basically we have to fill the climbers uh have to fill and you, you know and you can fill them uh negatively if you want you can say oh this is incomplete or you can fill them with something that's in the long term for your experience is is i think a little bit more positive is is that oh i can try this thing that's impossible or that looks impossible or that feels impossible for you know for as long as I have with it. And there is value in that. It seems like the people that get the most out of this kind of thing are, are, are people that can understand the value of having little time on a problem. Um, when, when Ontario switched our youth competitions from being like scramble format to like a, a world cup style format at an effect that it had that I didn't expect was for a lot of athletes, their level of stress went way down at competitions, which is unique because you would figure a scramble has to be somehow more relaxed than a World Cup format. But it turns out scramble is stressful because you're running around trying to find a problem that works for you and you and you, you don't really know where to look because there's 60 problems and you're just like losing your shit, right? Yeah. Whereas in, in the World Cup style, it gave some athletes the opportunity to say at least I can let it go. I had no choice. The problem is just going to be washed away in five minutes. So I can, I can relieve myself of any burden that my decisions let me down rather than my climbing skill. Um, and it, it, that, that was just kind of making me think about that when we're talking about these different time scales of problems in a gym setting, it's you get different people seem to, uh, be attracted to different areas of the climbing gym. The the backfill attracts a certain area of people, those that have the patience to create their own problems, the people that understand themselves well enough to know what it is that they're looking for exactly in a climb, and the people that are, are willing to invest, you know, months on a problem and that find that fulfilling rather than extremely boring. Um, the, the circuits, the seven-day circuits, have value for those comp climbers, but it's also great for the guys that come in two or three times a week and just want something new and they don't really care to develop 
any kind of lasting relationship with a boulder. It's not important to them that if they didn't get it this week that, you know, at least I'll have two or three or four more weeks to get it done. They don't really give a shit so long as there's something fun that they can succeed on or get close to succeeding on the next time they visit they're happy they don't they don't need the stuff that stays up for for four or five weeks so in in my mind i feel like this seven day turnover has actually been more of a benefit for this new kind of gym climber that maybe didn't actually get that much attention previously the people that were forced to to climb the the four week old five week old six week old stuff and it turns out they would just rather have new stuff all the time um, to best serve competitive climbers who really do, like you mentioned, have a five minute relationship with the most important boulders in their life. How far can you take this idea of shrinking and shrinking and shrinking the lifespan of a boulder, um, before it becomes impractical <laughs> i feel like impracticality is like we're already bordering on the edge of it if we were really desperate but um, yeah. like how you know you leave a boulder problem up for a day that sounds like a cool unique thing that you do every once in a while um at what point do you just say you know we're going to leave this up for an hour you know what's what's right. what's really worth trying in a gym setting i if well I mean, gonna, you're going to say all of it, not I, try. I imagine. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> certainly. Yeah, if you were uh, if you were on the Rockheads feed a few days ago, you saw that a few people were in the backfield doing one shots. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's that's a, a shorter amount of time that we must do the exact same things that we were talking about in the week of uh, or in the span of a week as a short period of time. I think that. If we are, one of the things that we do to lift the 100-pound weight is, uh, is to lift the 5-pound weight. But I think it's also to, to pull on the 200-pound weight. We, I think we work the problem from both angles. And so if we want, we, we, do, we take long-standing boulders. We do something like the, the seasonal project, you know, the winter project or the 10-year project. Uh, and, and we, we practice that and take all of the things we can from that. But we also go as far as we can in the opposite direction. You know, we take a boulder that literally, as we are climbing, someone is pointing to the next hold. And I think that teaches us, you know, a whole, um, a whole breadth of skills that we can use in a variety of scenarios uh so how far would i take that experiment I, I would take it as far as possible i would take it you know as far as i can see is is reasonable and really towards what is unreasonable uh you know we're we're maybe we're not even climbing the boulder anymore we're literally just flashcards. you know we see the boulder for 10 seconds and we think how to climb it uh, those, the, what we're, what I'm really trying to do is, uh, to bring in a lot of the aspects of, of training to climbing and to climbers that we decided was for someone else was for professional climbers or was for Adamandra only, uh, he, he, his particular style of visualization, uh, and, and say, Hey, actually we might be able to draw um, advantage for everyone. You know, we described all of the different people that would use different aspects of the gym or different places because of their aptitudes. But I think we are also talking about a single climber uh, and, and how all of those different things and the different aspects uh, of different types of climbing, for example, are contributing to uh, a single person's experience. So yeah, I mean, to, to that, that was this, the long answer of I would take the experiment very far. You know, uh, there's a root setter in Copenhagen. Uh, his name is Bjorn Isanger, and he uh, is one of my favorite humans for for one thing, but also very very into the idea that we should uh, part of our jobs as root setters is to provoke things from the climbers 
Uh, and, and, you know, Bjorn is one person for sure that I think uh, is very interested in taking things very far. Uh, so, you know, there are similar... Chris Danielson is, you know, taking things in a very particular place and he's taking them very far. And I think that, you know, Tande's doing things like that. All, all, all the, the people that I really... Uh, a lot of the people that I really enjoy working with um, and enjoy talking really, really uh, intensely with uh, are, are doing something like that. They're, they're finding an aspect that we can really, really dig deeply into and take to a really, really, really far place so that we can use it in as many places as possible. Let's end on the opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, <laughs> super hyper long-term uh, route setting. So yeah. not, not to talk about outside, but inside, I guess, like the, the kind of benchmarks are, are those really long-standing backfills, the... You know, whether it's like a cat's kind of example where you've got a, you know, a decade long proj or whatever, uh, or something more current being the, the Black Diamond project in Stockholm, like a, a route that is still up. No idea how many people are, are actually still giving that thing a burn. Maybe somebody mm -hmm. um, is. I, I know you're going to say there is some value to it, but is there, you know, room for every gym in a, in a metropolitan area to, to be leaving up projects that are longer than six months, longer than a year? Is there, and do people like, is there a different way to set that? We talk about, you know, trying to set extremely high quality competition problems because that is kind of the most relevant style for short term uh, problems. But how do you feel about setting at the other end? Uh, I mean, I, I think that uh, in terms of fit, that's uh, up to I, I, that's sort of place by place. It is up to the, the team uh, in that zone, I think, to A, to decide uh, and to experiment with. But I don't want to go to climbing gyms and see the same thing all the time. And I don't think it serves us very well to uh, envision a climbing gym that's the same as the last climbing gym. I, there are aspects obviously that we want to hold on to that, you know, and there are aspects also that we sort of need to hold on to definitionally. Um, but I think that the breadth of what is available uh, is not explored uh, enough in a lot of the gyms that I go to uh, or a lot of the context that I'm in. And uh, it, I think it's, it's cool to, to see that expand. So for, for the long-term boulder or, you know, cats is, is a great example of a very, very famous wall that changes infrequently, incredibly infrequently. Um, and I, I do think that, Yes, each gym can take some aspect, a token of that idea, and bring it into their uh, context, particular scenario. Uh, and, and, you know, in terms of experimentation, in terms of offering an experience to people that they may value, I think that's a great idea. Um, I mean, you know, there are logistical problems with, uh, you know, after this boulder route stays up for five years, uh, or it's it's probably the holds are in the conditions of the climbing are different, you know. So there are other uh, things that we have to deal with. Do we take this thing down every two months and then reset it, uh, or, or or things like that? But I, I think that it's it's definitely worth um, taking a. a new frames of time uh, as, you know, to bring it right back to the conversation and seeing how they uh, A, can affect the production of the thing that we're making, uh, but also the consumption and the experience that eventually uh, those things translate to. Cool. Well, let's leave it there. I really appreciate your time, man. I know you've got family waiting for you. Uh, so, uh, so thanks for making some, uh, some space from Salt Lake. Uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon. Yeah, for sure. Uh, for everybody watching. Yeah, have a good one. 
Yeah, it's all good, man. Uh, thanks to everybody watching. If you enjoy this kind of conversation, make sure you subscribe. If you want to talk about indoor climbing and everything boring from route setting to selling day passes, make sure you join the Discord. And if you want to support content like this, you can check out the Patreon as well. Thanks again to IO, and we'll see you all in the next one. Have a good one.